that first time you got wowed by a magic trick? Remember that first time you seen somebody put a core out your ear? Or a rabbit out the hat? Remember the first time you ever seen someone make it rain? And I don't mean like a strip club make it rain. I mean actually make it rain. Or make a car appear or disappear. You remember the first time you actually seen something like the Carbonaro effect? Where you see things that actually make you question everything you ever known, anything you ever seen, question your own sanity. You remember that? You remember ever asking a magician, how did you make this quarter appear in my ear? How did you pull that rabbit out the hat? How did you make it rain? How did you make that car disappear? And a magician never tells you how they do their tricks. But today we're going to expose that trick. Because we all know how these magic tricks happen. That wonderful word called misdirection. That's right, people. Misdirection is how magic tricks happen. What does misdirection mean? It means while you're sitting here watching, thinking and watching the magic trick, the true magic happens somewhere else. Abracadabra. You've been misdirected. You've been forced to look at the trick. Why? The actual trick and everything's unfolding somewhere else. What does it have to do with today's show? Well, I guess you gotta wait and find out, people. Welcome to the Past the Present Podcast. I'm your host, Alan the Great. I want to thank you for being here for another week for another episode with me. As always, the Past the Present Podcast is brought to you by those wonderful people at Henry's House Media Productions. So let's get into today's show, people. Misdirection, abracadabra, magic tricks. We're going to talk about it all today, people. That's right. We're going to talk about immigration today. Now, what does immigration have to do with magic? Absolutely nothing. Typically, magic doesn't happen with immigration, even though a lot of immigrants wish that magic would happen because they would be actually reunited with their families that's locked in detention centers, giving their freedom to become U.S. citizens without jumping through holes, without having to hide, be able to escape poverty and all the violence from their home state, assured that these immigrants that's coming from these other places of poverty-stricken and violence would like to have a little bit of magic in their lives to change their circumstances and allow them to get just a small piece of the American pie and the bigger piece of the American dream. But we're going to hear a talk about that, people. Because we're here to talk about immigration. But as usual, we're not going to talk about history of immigration because we're not interested in that. So we're not going to talk about what happened during World War II in this country where a lot of immigrants were locked into cages. And what I mean by immigrants, Japanese immigrants. During World War II, after Pearl Harbor was born, that's right, Japanese people who were national, U.S. national citizens were forced into cages, sort of like the ones you've seen in Germany. Well, of course, we wasn't sitting here gassing them. We wasn't gassing them. We wasn't starving them to death, but we did relieve them of their own property. That's right. Japanese citizens during World War II was relieved of their property, relieved of all their belongings, given one hour to gather all their things, only to be taken to a camp during World War II. Now, why were they taken to this camp, you might be wondering? Why would this happen? But we're not talking about history, so we're just going to talk about the facts. So, well, the fact of the matter is, during World War II, there was... An issue and worry that Japanese citizens could be spies for the Japanese Empire and could sabotage or um or army bases or places where produce weapons, planes, and other things we needed to keep the war machine going. Of course, of course, this was uh, understandable and easy to explain and easily acceptable acceptable by the citizens of America at the time who were in fear after Pearl Harbor and was doing anything to protect the homeland. Now, what does that have to do in Japanese being captured and put, forced into camps have to do with our current situation that we are right now, where we have a lot of immigrants who are trying to escape Mexico being forced into camps? Well, what it has to do with it is simply this, people. History repeats itself. And as you look at this in horror, as people or families are being separated, children are being forced into camps, as well as adults being separated and even led out to adoption. You have to go back into history and wonder, does history repeat itself? Absolutely true. It does. And you see this in the case of what happened back during World War II with the Japanese people and what's happening now with the Mexican immigrants who are trying to escape poverty and a lot of times the violence that's been put on towards their family. But we're getting way above the curve, aren't we? We're getting way above the curve, people. So let's back this thing up a little bit. Let's move a little further. Let's get this thing started because we're sitting here talking about misdirection, abracadabra, and a lot of magic what's happening in the magic that these immigrants would like to see. Well, we have a big issue in this country today. We have a big issue with drugs. And don't worry, we're not going to talk about the history of drugs. We already talked about that episode, people. By the way, fentanyl, you know, that drug was actually made and created 
as a synthetic opiate to help with pain relief and been approved by the federal government. But you didn't hear that from me. You didn't hear that from me, people. That came from the DEA, DEA actually, from their assessment of 2018, talking about the problem and the epidemic with drugs. But we're not here to talk about drugs. We're here to talk about immigration, so we need to stay on task, okay? So, Mexicans and uh, Mexicans who are tra traveling through the desert, traveling to go across the border to escape into America, looking for, like I said, a piece of the American pie and a bigger piece of the American dream, are being held captive in cages. They're being separated from their families, in some cases never to be reunited. As we also found out that the President of the United States, our current President, has also received a... Um, a ruling in his favor to build a wall to separate Mexico from America to keep immigrants from intruding in on our great country. Now, why is all this important and where are we going at with this? Well, we have an issue with immigration, like I said before and I said multiple times. We have an issue where immigration, immigrants are starting to flood into America. Where are they escaping? We already mentioned it. They're escaping violence as well as poverty. But the problem is not what they're escaping. The problem is, is many Americans, what are we feeling? What are we feeling, Americans? What are we feeling, American citizens? We're feeling like we're being put out of jobs. We feel like we're being put in danger. Because as immigrants come, doesn't it increase the chances of rape, murder? Doesn't it increase the, the lack of jobs? Doesn't it increase the opportunity of putting us back into a recession? Losing our jobs. We feel like our children are now in danger. And we're in danger. We're in danger to seeking back into poverty. So we must do something about this flood of immigration that continues to come to America. We need to stop the flood. And the only way to stop the flood is by putting up a wall. But that's not the only thing we're fearful of. We're not just fearful of the rape and murder of our women and our children. We're not just fearful of the fact that our jobs are in danger. We're also in fear of, like I said about fentanyl and that we're not going to talk about drug addiction. We're worried about the flood of drugs that continually to cross the border every single day into America from Mexico. We're fearful of the overdose, the drug epidemic, the heroin epidemic that we're all facing, that we're having a hard time capping. We worry about all these things, people. And the only way to stop these things is we have to stop the flood of immigrants because these flood of immigrants is bringing these things into our country. Right? Right? That gotta be right because if you read newspapers, you hear it enough and the president said that it has to be correct, right? Well, let's talk about it, people. Let's talk about it. Let's start with the drugs, okay? Now, it is true that drugs come into America, but there's also true that America exports just as many guns to Mexico as drugs as Mexicans export drugs into America. So it seems like a fair exchange going between America and Mexico. Well, the issue is detrimental for both countries because where we keep getting drugs and it's dealing with a major drug epidemic that we're having a hard time capping, Mexico is dealing with serious violence, epidemic with violence forcing a lot of their residents and their citizens to try to escape Mexico to find somewhere safer to raise their children. So while we supply guns to Mexico, Mexico supplies drugs to us. But that's even more justifiable and more of a reason we need to build a wall, right? Because we got to cap off this steady flow of drugs coming to our country because that's where a vast amount of drugs are coming from, right? They're coming across the border. That's where a mass, mass amount of drugs are coming from, correct? Well, that'd be wrong too. Mass amount of drugs are truly coming from them. Most drugs are not coming from across the Mexican border. In reality, they're coming through our actual ports, people. That's right. Through our coastal ports is where most of the drugs and majority of the drugs that's coming to our country are coming from, including that wonderful synthetic drug of opium, fentanyl. And yes, I'm being very sarcastic if you haven't caught that part of me, people, when I address fentanyl the way I did. So these drugs are coming through ports. Coming through containers, because you probably wonder, what, are they just putting them on ships and just sell them in? Well, of course not. They're putting them in containers. If you don't know what a container is, it's a big metal box that usually carry things like food, cars, and other things that are exported from different countries. They're exported into this country and then illegally distributed to through the underground to the people and your family members who are addicted to drugs. So reality is building a wall to prevent Mexican immigrants from coming into this country is not going to stop the huge flow of drug, drugs that's continuing to flow into our country. Because the reality is, unless we're going to build a wall around the ports of our country, there is no way to stop that flood. So we debunk that. So maybe that's not the issue. Well, you still have the murder and rape issue, right? And think about this. Fear is something that's not something we're born with, but we're taught. We're taught to be fearful, right, people? Well, of course, history also taught us to be fearful. So when we talk about history and we talk about immigrants, we got to think about the Mario um, boat lift, where the refugees from Cuba were sent to America. 
1979. We're not going to talk about history, people. We're just going to go back and real quick, take a quick history trip. Or not history trip. I don't want to say the word history. We're going to take a field trip back into history just to talk about something real quick. 1979, Joe Carter. I think his name is Joe Carter. Jim Carter. I think that's his name. I said Joe Carter. I'm thinking about Toronto, Toronto Blue Jays. Sorry. President Jim Carter, or President Carter, he signed the act to let refugees from Cuba to come into America. Okay? To allow, I think, 17,000 Cuban refugees to come and seek asylum in America. Now, in reality, um, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro seen this as an opportunity to let go all his undesirables out of the country, flush the toilets of Cuba into America, as he so eloqu eloquently put it. And that he did. He sent all the peoples out of his prison, all the undesirable people from Cuba into America, America not to seek the American dream. But to rid his country of all the criminals, all the rapists, all the murders, all the people that he did not want to deal with. And with that being said, and with him doing that, America, of course, our ports was overwhelmed by this flooding of the Cuban people. And not only the flooding, but it also sent people to Miami during the cocaine cowboy days in the A's who were criminals and out to murder and rape. The crime rate skyrocketed at this point in time, and it led us to believe and put a permanent fixture in our minds that immigrants are here to rape, kill, maim, and cause damage to our communities. Communities, excuse me. So of course that fear was placed in our hearts, placed in our minds. So we fast forward to 2019, where we currently sit, people, and it's still fresh in our minds for when the Cuban people came to our country and all the violence that followed, all the crime. And when we think about what's happening in Mexico with the cartels, the constant murders, the constant killing, and the drugs is flowing back and forth across the border, the guns, the money, we start to wonder, do we truly need a wall to build us, to protect our families, to protect our very way of living, to protect the American dream? Do we really need it? Or is this another unnecessary tactic that we're taking on to isolate ourselves from the truth? Because as we said, the magic trick is misdirection. So if we make you focus on one problem, then you kind of don't see the other. Which is, the drugs are still coming through our port. A lot of the drug addiction and the drugs that you see and people are overdosing on are not truly brought in from Mexico. They're brought in from other countries as well as our own drug administration. That's right, our own drug administration. But we don't want to focus on drugs. We're not going to do that. We're going to focus on immigration and these poor little children who are locked in cages right now and are being separated from their family and living in poverty-stricken situations. We don't want to focus on that because, let's be honest, we can sit here and blame the president for that and the government, but the reality is even the Democratic uh, presidential hopefuls are not speaking on this problem and are not truly looking for a resolution to the issue with the immigration problem. So is it on us to figure out an issue? Is it on us to figure out how to come up with a solution to these things? Maybe so. But we're not done yet, people. We still got one more fact that we need to bring up. One more problem where we have an issue with immigration because this is the big one that I always hear from people when they mention immigration. The loss of jobs. That's right, people. We're all fearful of slipping back into that recession. We all remember the recession where a lot of people not only lost their jobs but lost their homes. Was once who people were Fortune 500 companies and were once millionaires and had a very wealthy life were then put on food stamps due to the recession. A financial decline in our economy, which we will not want to go back to. But if we continue to have a flood of immigrants coming in our country, of course this could rescind us back into the dark ages and back into those times. I know I had a concern. I used to say the same thing about immigrants, immigration and the constant flow of immigration. I used to say, well, you know, think about this. In your home, if you have a home where you're used to feeding and shopping for four people, and then six other people come in, what does that do? That kind of puts you behind the eight ball and make it more difficult for you to manage your home. So we put that in the context of our country and immigrants flowing in. Would it be the same? Would it be the same? Because we're still focused and we're still worried about our jobs and losing our jobs and our comfortable way of living. So it made me think even further about jobs and are we in danger of losing our jobs? Then I visit Walmart, my local Walmart to just go get some groceries, some things for around the house. And you know, I noticed something when I went to check out. I noticed there was only one person that had registered and that all the other registers were not only unmanned, unwomaned, but were operated simply by self-serving yourself. Meaning self-serving self, meaning you ring yourself up. You, you ring yourself up, you pay, there is no t attendant there to ring yourself up. There is no friendly smile anymore. And then I said, hmm, AI is truly starting to have a big impact on the way we shop, and even on our stores, and our job. 
But then I said, okay, maybe this is just Walmart. It's just a simple thing at Walmart. Then I went to the local McDonald's and I chose to get me a quarter pounder with cheese, a large fry, and a chocolate milkshake. Then I realized that I no longer have to go to a cash register to order my meal. I can go to a little kiosk and punch in my own order. So, you know, if anybody ever been to a McDonald's, Burger King, or Wendy's, you understand that they normally screw up your order, don't always get everything you order. So, now you're in charge of your order. You can pick the things you want. You don't want onions on that burger? No problem. You can put that you don't want the onions on a burger. Self-serve. We don't need a person at the register no more. Then I start thinking about, let me go get a soda. Then I realize now, we can freestyle our soda. Mix a bunch of different flavors in our soda. We don't need anybody making our sodas no more because the soda machine is operated by you, the customer. You can pick whatever soda you want. You can mix and match the sodas if you want without asking anybody to do it anymore. Why do I mention all this about AI and that AI is a big thing and technology is a big thing? Why we worry about immigrants taking our jobs, the reality of the situation is immigrants are not the ones taking our job. AI is taking our job. And if you don't know what AI is, it's artificial intelligence, people. Artificial intelligence are taking our jobs because the reality is jobs that were typically low-end jobs, such as working at Walmart or cash register, working at the McDonald's or local Burger King, are no longer needed for people to stand there and take your order no more. No longer needed to flash you a smile at that local Walmart as you ring out your items. Now you can do it yourself. And the only thing you're going to see a smile at is the reflection of yourself in the camera view as you scan out your, your items and check out your items. So we wonder, can immigrants really affect the way that we are making our money? Well, our, losing our money is already in danger. Think about this. One more thing. GM power plants and all kinds of car plants have been shut down years ago. Why? Because you realize that machines can build cars not only faster, but they don't need brakes. They don't need to take lunch breaks, smoke breaks, and they don't need to socialize. They can work throughout the day without taking a break and even give you less worry about accidents. That's right. You don't have to worry about somebody slipping, falling, breaking their ankle, getting a cut, or being sued for any other work-related injury, or even taking vacation time. So when you think about it, artificial intelligence plays a bigger factor into us losing our jobs and affecting our economy more than immigration does. So what's truly our issue with immigration then, people? What's truly our issue? What's truly the issue with all this? Well, the true issue is this. You get put fear in your head. You're taught to be fearful of things. You're taught to be fearful of people. And your reality is you look at people and you don't judge a person based off their character. You judge a person based off the color of their skin, the way they look, the type of neighborhood they have, the way they dress, or even how they speak or the language they speak. And that's how we address and that's how we deal with people. We don't trust a person based off their character no more. We look at a person and immediately assume whether we can trust them or not. We look at their political point of views and wonder, are they a bad person or a good person? We look at where they came from and we immediately assume if you don't speak the typical language of an American person, that you're an immigrant and that you're here for reasons that are not good. It's amazing how our minds work and how we choose to deal with the immigration. And as we sit here and we look at the issue of the constant flood of immigration, don't we have to look at ourselves? And don't we got to look at how we judging people? Don't we got to look at these people who are risking their lives to cross into America? Don't we have to focus on that being an issue? Because think about this. For those people who are trying to leave Mexico, to cross that, that desert in the night with their children, women, sometimes alone with their young children, think about the risk they are taking to get to America, to find that American dream, to get a little piece of that American pie. Think about what's in danger. You ever, know, you ever heard about coyotes? No, I'm not talking about the coyotes that's out in the desert that try to bite you and they're like dogs. I'm not talking about those type of coyotes. I'm not talking about the answer. But actual coyotes being people who, Mexican people are people who are in the desert, in the dark, seeking to capture and kidnap those people who are trying to cross over to, cross over to America. So why are they kidnapping them? Kidnapping them for money? Well, you're not kidnapping a person for money who's already in poverty and trying to escape poverty and danger. So what are you kidnapping them for? Well, you kidnap them to be drug mules. You kidnap, you kid, kidnapping them. Excuse me, can't speak clearly. You are kidnapping them to not only be drug mules, but human trafficking. And these people are not only in danger in their own cities, in their own communities, but they're even more dangerous trying to cross over and to get freedom. But as they get into America, a lot of times they're detained and forced to be separated from the family they're trying to save, not knowing what's going to happen to their children. Sometimes they're being sent back to the country where they're in danger. And what about the dreamers who lived in America for quite some time? 
What is a dreamer? I'm not talking about a person that's sleeping people, but a dreamer is a person, an immigrant who lived in America for a long time, pays taxes, live a normal life, ha doesn't come to break laws, don't come to steal your jobs, kidnap and rob your kids. They're just like you and me, every other American, who just want a small piece of American pie. What about them? And the fact that now, that they live in danger and fear of being separated from their families, being imported back into a country that doesn't love them as much as they love it. Imagine that, people, as you think about this problem with immigration and you assume or you come up with your opinion on immigration. It's time for us to deepen our thoughts, deepen our mindsets, and broaden our horizon of our mind goals. Our mind's a very powerful place, and our strongest muscle in our body. But normally we don't exercise this muscle. Sometimes we choose to go into things with a closed mind rather than open thoughts. But a closed mind is a very dangerous place. Because if information can't flow through, then it definitely can't flow out. So it's time for us to rethink things, people. Rethink how we treat people. And maybe rethink how we look at the immigration laws and immigrants who are trying to come to America. Now, I'm not saying that we need to have a constant, steady flow of immigrants flow into the country and just let every anyone in. But I am saying we need to rethink how we're handling this. We need to reimagine this. And we need to open the doors and open our minds and our mouths for discussion to correctly solve this problem. So that we're no longer separating families from each other. That we're no longer putting people at risk. It's time for us to figure out a way to filter out the bad from the good. I want to thank you for joining me for another episode of the Past the Present Podcast. As usual, I'm your host, Alan the Great. I want to thank you for being here for another episode. As usual, hit me up. Facebook, Past Present, Instagram, Alan the Great. Hit me on YouTube, Alan the Great. Subscribe to my channel, like, comment, share the video. Let me know what you think. You can always use the hashtag Past the Present Podcast, hashtag uh, immigration, hashtag no more. Because we're open in the conversation to talk about how we can come up with solutions to these problems rather than focusing on the issue. And until next time I speak to you or next time I see you, I only got one thing left to say to you, people. Stay tuned. Peace.